it's out to you after uh, presentation tonight. So if you have any follow-up questions, you can review this. I'm going to wait one more minute and then we'll get started. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for being with us tonight for the ARPA Gun Violence Prevention and Intervention uh, Funding Opportunity for uh, 2024. Um, we appreciate your uh, interest in this and investment in our community. Um, so thank you for everything that you are already doing and what you may be able to do uh, as part of this funding opportunity to reduce um, gun violence in our community. My name is Joe Cobb. I'm the vice mayor for the city of Roanoke. I've been on city council since 2018. Uh, I am also currently serving as the chair of the Gun Violence Prevention Commission. And I'll invite my other two co-hosts uh, to introduce themselves. Laura, do you wanna go next? Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Carini, Senior Assistant City Attorney. I work on the implementation team for all of the ARPA funds, and I also provide support to the Gun Violence Prevention Commission. Thank you, Laura. And Angie? Good evening, everyone. I'm Angie O'Brien. I'm um, one of the Assistant City Managers. And, and uh, first, Thank you all for joining us tonight. And second, I apologize for being off camera and sounding the way I do. So parts of this meeting, um, I'll probably quickly go on mute um, just to cough and then I'll come back. I'm a little bit under the weather. I don't know if I have a, a cold or RSV or the flu or COVID or all of them together. It's the way I feel tonight. So, um, but anyway, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Angie. And we're hope we hope you're feeling better soon. Um, so I believe many of you have been able to see the uh, application that was shared out through the city's social media and through emails from me and maybe others that shared this with you. Um, before I get into a walkthrough of the application, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to bring this up on the shared screen, I want us to do introductions so that we know who is here. Um, some of our many collaborative partners within the city who care very deeply about this issue and this challenge and, and how we can address it together. What I'm going to do is go through my screen and call your name. And then if you would uh, unmute and just uh, tell us which organization you're with, um, and then we'll get through that as quickly as possible. So the first one I see is Rachel Hopkins. Hi, I'm Rachel Hopkins, and I'm the CEO of JIP of the Roanoke Valley. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Dr. Deneen Evans. Deneen, you're still on mute. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening again. I am the owner of Mosaic Mental Wellness and Health, and we have a nonprofit entity called Chrysalis, which is specializing in working with children and families diagnosed with disabilities and trauma. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Uh, Mackenzie Lewis. Hey, uh, this is Mackenzie Lewis, founder of Hoop Love Academy. Uh, we do basketball and life skill development for youth and young adults in the Roanoke Valley and surrounding areas. Welcome, Mackenzie. Thank you. Uh, Daisy Ball. Hi, I uh, direct the, the criminal justice program at Roanoke College, and I also bring inside out to our local jails and prisons, where I bring Roanoke College students into uh, facilities and they have class with insiders. So thank you. Thank you, Daisy. It's nice to meet you. Uh, it was great to see your um, recent celebration with the uh, detention center here in Roanoke. Thank oh, you for yeah, your work. We're so appreciative. Thank you. 
Sheila Heron. You're on mute, Sheila. Nice to see you. My name is Sheila Heron, and I also work at Mosaic Mental Wellness and Health in partnership with Chris Ellis, a nonprofit. And I work directly with gun violence victims right now and children and adults. And I see them in our office daily um, and weekly. And I'm really excited about um, the access to grant money to continue doing the great work that we've been doing. Thank you, Sheila. All right, Kim Thomas. Hey there, this is Kim Thomas, Vice President with the YMCA of Virginia's Blue Ridge, which includes the Kirk Family Y and the Gainsboro YMCA. Excited to be a part of the call. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Brian Fraction. Hello, I'm Brian Fraction. I'm the Director at Youth Advocate Programs, um, also known as YAP. And we provide um, services with um, Department of Social Services, Arono County, and other um, agencies, including Department of Juvenile Justice, providing advocacy services, um, parent support services, and uh, mentoring, case coordination. Thank you, Brian. A quick question before we go on. Can we uh, turn on the chat for everyone? It should be working now. Okay, it should be working now. So thank you um, for that question. All right, uh, Hunter Hartley. Uh, hi, my name is Hunter Hartley. Uh, I'm with uh, Lick Run Community Development Corporation. We do uh, youth programs uh, and workforce development uh, around agriculture. Uh, and I'm also going to introduce Katie Struble, who's also on the call, but she just texted and asked if I would introduce her because she's in a very busy, loud space right now and is only able to listen. And she's also an okay. instructor in our program. Okay, great. Thanks, Hunter. Uh, Leslie Clark. Hi, I'm Leslie. I serve as the Director for Family Health Strategies with United Way Roanoke Valley. Thanks for being here, Leslie. Um, Rita, Joyce, welcome. Hi, yes, um, founder and president of Fed Up, Families Expecting Deliverance Use and Prayer. We work directly with the families of the victims of gun violence. Thank you. Jamie Mather. Hey, uh, I'm Jamie Mather. I'm representing the Roanoke City Little League, and uh, I'm also the president of the City Council Appointed Youth Advisory Review Board for Youth Athletics. Thank you and welcome. Uh, Bishop Jackson, welcome. Good afternoon to everyone. Hope everybody is doing well and happy holidays to you. I am the lead pastor and resident bishop of the Refreshing Church here in the city of Roanoke. Uh, Virginia, uh, which we have a lot of youth programs and ministries going on, as well as um, impact to the city. And one of those partnerships is another organization that I am representing tonight, and that is the Fed Up organization, where you just heard from our president and founder. And I serve as a chaplain for that particular board and organization. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, Gideon Linkus, welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Gideon Linkus, and I'm a grant writer at Total Action for Progress. So. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Rolando Holmes. Good evening, everybody. I'm uh, Rolando Holmes, the director of programs at the Foundry, and we offer youth programs uh, at a number of different levels, in-school support services, mentoring programs, after-school summer camps, things like that. Thank you, Rolando. Latifa Trent. Hello, everyone. Um, Latifa Trent. I'm with um, TAP, um, Youth Service and Education Manager. We have um, Project Discovery, Girls United Program, Coaching Boys into Men, and several other um, programs and things that we do with youth throughout the city. And um, we are trying to partner with Roanoke City Public Schools to offer more um preventative programs as well. Thanks, Latifa. 
Uh, Marvin Fields, welcome. How you all doing? I'm Marvin Fields. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Fields of Hopes and Dreams Mentoring, as well as Youth Empowerment Foundation. We work with children who have experienced trauma. We do Casey Life Skills parenting groups, and we also work with children who have already experienced gun violence, and we're working to eradicate some of that within our, our Roanoke community. We've got a lot of things that we're doing right now to do that and to move forward in that within our city. Thank you, Marvin. Cheryl Mosley. Good evening, Cheryl Mosley with United Way Roanoke Valley and Young Docs Roanoke. And I also have with me Marion Ware with Young Docs Roanoke. Great, welcome Marion. Uh, Doug Jackson. Good evening, I'm Douglas Jackson. I'm the Arts and Culture Coordinator for the City of Roanoke and I staff the 15 person volunteer Roanoke Arts Commission. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Linda Henschel for. Hi, I'm Linda Henschel with Family Service of the Roanoke Valley. Um, Rihanna Price is also joining from Family Service. She was having trouble connecting, and I wanted to make sure someone got on. So I think we're both here together. Thank you, and welcome, Brianna. Uh, Mackenzie Chitwood. Hi, I'm Mackenzie Chitwood with Blue Ridge Behavioral Healthcare Prevention and Wellness Services, and I'm representing the Roanoke Prevention Alliance. Excellent. Jan uh, Keister. Jan, are you able to speak? If not, I know Jan is with Kids Soar and also works for legal aid in Roanoke. Um, Darnell Wood. Hello. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. I'm Darnell Wood. Um, uh, Community coordinator, outreach coordinator with Hill Street Baptist Church. I'm um, also on the Youth Advisory uh, Review Board with the Department of Parks and Recreation. Uh, and I'm just glad to be here and hopefully uh, we can get things done and reduce what's going on in Rono. All right. Thank you. Um, Angie, it looks like Chris Tilly Loves is saying she has no way to enter as a panelist. I'm not sure. Um, Hey, Chris, can you hear us? Are you able yes. to unmute? Okay, I'll, uh, Chris, I'm going to go ahead and have you introduce yourself then. Chris, can you unmute and, and tell us your organization? I think I'm here now. You are. Um, my name is Chris Tilly Lobs, and I am the past president and CEO of Casa Latina Roanoke Valley. We provide services for the Spanish speaking community in the Roanoke Valley, and we address educational and basic needs ranging from information services about equity and housing to food distribution, to classes on computer literacy, to nutrition, and the list goes on for longer than you want to listen. All right, thank you, Chris. Uh, let me see here, Heather Johnson. I don't know if you're able to hear me. I'm not sure if it unmuted. Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear okay, you. Great. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm here uh, on behalf of Roanoke College with Dr. Daisy Ball, kind of keeping an ear out for how our criminal justice program might be able to um, partner with you all on this. Um, Great. I'm a grant writer. Excellent. Thanks. Um, uh, okay, Rihanna Price, I think, uh, did Linda introduce you earlier, Rihanna? Okay, good. She did. Okay, great. Uh, Ann Rogers, welcome. Hey, um, yes, I'm Ann Rogers. I'm the grant writer with Presbyterian Community Center, and I'd like to offer our gratitude for the gun violence grant funding that we received during the previous 12 months. Uh, this funding is tremendously appreciated as a source of uh, funding to serve the needs of students in Southeast Roanoke. Thank you. Thank you, Ann, and thank you for your outreach to, to so many youth in Southeast. We appreciate it. Beth Davidson. 
Hi, um, I am with uh, Shifting Paradigms Consulting Group. I'm a private reading specialist and I serve kids um, kindergarten through college um, with a lot of executive function and uh, reading disabilities um, and other types of disabilities. And as well, I have uh, my nonprofit, educational nonprofit is Why Not Workshop. Thank you, Beth. Uh, Latori Woodbury. Yeah, I'm here. How you doing? Good. Welcome. Tell us what your Thanks. organization, Latori. That's Latori Woodbury, Boxing and Brawl in Roanoke, Virginia. Thank you. All right. Josh Johnson. Hi, I'm the uh, Youth Development and Intervention Coordinator for Roanoke City Public Schools. Thanks for having us. Thanks for being here, Josh. Uh, Angela Sweetenberg. Good evening, Angela Sweetenberg, representing We Charm. That's women every day changing hearts as role models. And um, we just support building women and girls throughout the Valley. Thank you, Angela. Uh, Jose Montez, welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Jose Banuelos Montes. Um, I represent Casa Latina and uh, already Chris, you know, give a little bit of background of the uh, of the organization. At this point, my capacity is a interim president of Casa Latina. Oh, fantastic. Welcome. Lee Stover. Lee, are you able to hear me? All right, we'll she come said back. She's to in a place that she can't talk, I think. Okay. Thank you. Well, welcome, Lee. And uh, my colleague on City Council, Stephanie Moon Reynolds. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much for the invitation. All right. I'm going to go back through my screen here to see if I've left anyone out. All right. Is there anyone that I did not call who is on the call in some form? And if you don't have access to um, be able to speak, if you could put that in the chat box. I think I got everybody. All right. Well, thank you all for joining the call tonight. Um, I'm going to ask um, Angie if she can bring up the application so that we can share that on the screen. Okay, can you see it? I can see it, but it's really um, enlarged, so I can only see like a the right-hand corner of the web. There we go. Okay. All right. So uh, what I'm going to do is just walk you through this application, uh, which has information about uh, the grant funds, uh, the time frame for the application. So we'll go this through this kind of step by step. This is an online application. Um, so uh, this is found on the city of Roanoke's website. Um, there's actually on the home page uh, down in news, uh, there's a, a highlighted news item that, that describes the funds and then takes you to this page and then you can click the link directly there. So Angie, if you'll go ahead and scroll down. This is the American Rescue Plan Act Gun Violence Prevention Commission grant application. Uh, um, the grant applications are already being received. The uh, application timeline opened Wednesday, December 6th. And this is for nonprofits, and that includes faith based organizations focused on prevention, intervention, and response initiatives to reduce gun violence in the community. The grant application period closes on Sunday, December 31st, 2023. And Angie, is that at midnight or 11.59 p.m.? Yeah, it'll be at 1159. Okay, so uh, for those of you who love that energy of working at the last minute, uh, which grant writers are so good at, um, you have until 1159 p.m. on the 31st. Um, this will help fund programs with a direct impact on gun violence prevention, intervention, and response, and are collaborative in nature. 
Uh, we really encourage this because we have so many extraordinary organizations within our community um, and we're able to expand our reach and impact when we collaborate with each other. I recognize that some of our nonprofits have very unique work. So uh, part of the challenge is to think about how you can take that unique work and partner with another organization potentially. Sometimes that's uh, viable and possible and sometimes it's not, but just keep that in mind. Uh, our priority focus area in the city is Northwest Roanoke. Uh, the primary reason for this um, is that as we have followed data uh, related to aggravated assaults and homicides um, in the city of Roanoke, um, over three quarters of all of those incidents have been taking place in Northwest Roanoke. This year alone, um, of the cases involving gun violence, of the 62 cases, 43 of those have occurred in Northwest Roanoke. So we really want to center our efforts in this part of the city as our top priority because of the urgency of this. And so please keep that in mind as you're considering your proposals. Um, the grants will uh, can be can be up to thirty thousand um, dollars to be distributed for activities to complete be completed by June 30, 2024. Now you may think that's a small window. It's a six month window from January to June. But that also reflects the timeline that we're working with within the ARPA funds and the urgency of the situation we're facing in Northwest Roanoke. Now, the next area I'm going to focus on are the, the grant focus areas. And these are some recommendations on what to focus on. If you have something outside of this that you think is viable, to uh, help uh, address one of these key areas of gun violence reduction in our community, we certainly encourage you to uh, pursue that in your proposal. Uh, so these are these are guiding uh, areas of focus. Youth development, that can include mentoring, it could include education, it could include life skills, it could include recreation, it, it could be a combination of those things. That is not an exclusive list. Those are some recommendations within youth development. Uh, mental health and trauma-informed counseling for families impacted by violence. We have discovered over the last several years that there are many individuals and families who want access to mental health counseling and trauma-informed counseling, but experience barriers, uh, whether it's cost or uh, a bunch of loopholes to jump through uh, to get to that. So we have worked really hard with organizations, mental health providers in the city uh, to make um, counseling and trauma-informed counseling more accessible. And uh, to the extent that we can continue to do that, it's very important. Work development, workforce development and employment. Uh, this can include workforce training, but we want to create a pathway to opportunity. In fact, um, the more these grants can help uh, redirect people who may be at higher risk for gun violence to um, move toward a pathway of opportunity that steers them away from a path of violence, um, we want to be able to do that. And workforce development training and employment uh, can provide some of those pathways. Uh, some of you may be aware of the um, apprenticeship program that we've, uh, we just finished the sixth cohort in the uh, city of Roanoke. These are high school students who receive HR training, uh, soft skills and hard skills, and then are placed in a department within the city government to work for three months. Um, and then hopefully to go on to work in businesses within our community. So again, this is about a pathway to opportunity. Uh, the fourth area is neighborhood outreach and safety programs. Um, this, this, is, this can be as narrowly focused or as broadly focused as you can imagine. So um, this could involve street cleanups, street outreach, uh, connecting with neighbors, making sure that um, we're checking in with people in a specific neighborhood over a period of time. 
Uh, one model example of this is the current United Way um, Neighbors United program, which is working on a five block, block section of Hanover, where there's been a, a number of high incidents of gun violence and uh, working with neighbors from a grassroots level to connect with them, to provide resources from cleanups to street outreach to most recently a health fair. Uh, code concerns, uh, checking in with neighbors to see if there are street lights out, if there are blighted properties, if there are houses sus suspected of drug activity or other code enforcement types issues that could be addressed in collaboration with the, the city department on code enforcement. This could be education, what's available in your neighborhood or in, in this part of the city, what kinds of resources. This would be a great opportunity to build on the What's Good Roanoke campaign and the one-stop shop through the website um, that connects people directly with resources. And then community events. So maybe your organization wants to do a combination of these things in a particularly focused area of Northwest. Um, that's something to consider. Um, one that's not on here that we'll be adding in the uh, focus areas is conflict resolution. If your organization uh, does uh, conflict mediation, conflict resolution, conflict transformation, uh, whether that's on a small scale or a larger scale, working with youth, with adults, um, this year, I would say probably 90% of the gun violence incidents that have resulted in homicide or aggravated assaults have occurred because of interpersonal violence, where someone has had a beef or an issue or an argument with somebody else. And rather than finding a healthy way to uh, resolve that conflict, they've pulled a gun and shot somebody. So uh, that's creating great concern for the community. And then the last is victim services and outreach, whether that is someone who's been injured or someone who's experienced loss or someone who is reeling from the trauma of uh, a, a family member uh, experiencing gun violence. Um, we do have a hospital-based intervention program through Carillion that um, if the person comes into the emergency department or is admitted to the hospital, they are offered resources and then um, have follow-up care for a year after that. But as partners with that, we wanna make sure that community uh, agencies are involved in connecting with people. Some people don't want, um, may not want that service provided by the hospital. They may feel more comfortable with somebody they know or an organization they know within the city. So those are, six key areas of focus. Again, they are not exclusive, uh, but those are particular key areas we're looking for. Some important dates to consider. Um, interested applicants for these funds will, uh, you are attending the meeting tonight. Um, and um, if, if your proposal is accepted and funded, there will be a second meeting on January 22nd at two o'clock p.m. Uh, that will help finalize some of those details. As part of that, um, as we do with all of our ARPA funding, um, once the grants are determined and distributed, your notif every organization that applied will be notified whether you receive funds or not. And um, Laura Carini, who's on the call tonight, and Angie O'Brien uh, will coordinate meetings with each organization to confirm details in an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding. They'll go over all the aspects of that Memorandum of Understanding. And it's really important as uh, applicants that you review that thoroughly and understand all of the components to that. Because um, uh, there are some things in that MOU that you will need to have in place as an organization. And at any stage of this, if you have any questions, you can certainly ask Angie or Laura, and they are they are great sources of wisdom on this and can guide you through that. All right, let's look at the application itself. Uh, state clearly state your organization name. Um, you might have a. Uh, it'd probably be good here to list your name that's on organizational name that's on your five hundred one c three. Um, your organization address, in other words, where you receive mail, 
uh, the city, the state, uh, your phone number, make sure this is a good phone number where we can reach you directly, and your website. If you don't have a website, but maybe have a Facebook page or some other form of social media where you uh, share your work, please include that there. All right, scroll on down, Angie. Uh, your executive director's name um, and their contact information. Um, Angie, uh, one thing that I did wonder about here for organizations that um, I, I believe the MOU has to be signed with the executive director of the organization or the primary contact. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. That's why we include those person's names here. Um, as far as questions to address in your proposal, um, the first thing is tell us how your program addresses gun violence and its reduction. And we want you to be specific. This is a real opportunity to say, how your organization can help us as a city uh, uh, both address and reduce gun violence through your proposed program. Uh, include as much information here as you possibly can. That will be uh, a, a very helpful determina determination in uh, not only looking at how much to fund your program, but also um, uh, how you plan to activate this over a six month time period. And I will also say if you, the more you can show how you can sustain this work, even beyond the life of this grant, that's very helpful and important. Uh, these are long term investments that we're making in our city so that as we see reductions in gun violence, we're going to see it over a long period of time, not just a short period of time. The second question uh, is, how would you describe the program's goal and anticipated qualitative and quantitative outcomes? So quantitative are those measurable outcomes. How many people do you intend to reach? How many people will you have served by the end of the program? How many events will you have? Those kinds of details that are more quantitative outcomes. The qualitative outcomes are uh, some of the narratives, some of the transformational stories, some of the things you anticipate to see as people's lives are changed and transformed through your program, how um, you anticipate seeing a reduction in gun violence through um, change in culture, change in attitudes, uh, change in relationships, uh, all as a means of strengthening those things. Uh, the third Portion is what is the amount of ARPA funds you are requesting to operate this program? Um, be as, as um, thoughtful here as you can be. We have a pool of funds and we want to be able to utilize these as effectively as possible. Um, if you ask for up to you know, 30,000 is the cap. If you ask for that, be very clear on how you intend to expend that. Um, if you believe you can deliver your program for 5,000, ask for 5,000, but, but have, a clear, have clarity around how much you believe this program is going to cost. Um, and uh, not only in terms of uh, implementing it, but in delivering the final results that you hope to deliver. Uh, the fourth question is, has this organization previously received grant funding? Just click yes or no. If you have, click yes. If you haven't, click no. Uh, that's just an informational uh, point for us to know if you've received funding before or not. Um, if you have, then you'll want to answer, uh, either way, you'll want to answer number five. Um, and that is, if you answered yes to that question and you have received funding, were your reports turned into the city of Roanoke timely? Um, this is sometimes a challenge because some of our organizations have one person that does everything. And some of our organizations have uh, multiple staff members who have different and unique responsibilities. Um, timely reporting is, is essential, um, not only for these ARPA funds, but for funds in general, uh, because in addition for your own level of accountability as an organization, we have that level of accountability as a city um, in, in terms of us reporting back to uh, the U.S. Treasury 
um, how the funds have been utilized. All right, you can go on down. All right, then there are a, a number of files uploads. Um, we would like for, and you can include all of this in one file or you can include it as separate files. Uh, just make sure that you are including all of this. And I see a question that popped up. Uh, Hunter, what's your question? Hey, uh, it was about whether or not the reporting had been done timely. We received uh, grant funding last year uh, through the same uh, offering, and we had our final report in on time, and we thought we were complying with the additional request, which was to, the way it was phrased was a bit ambiguous, but it, the, the gist of it was to keep the uh, Gun Violence Prevention Commission up to date with what's going on with feedback and you had attended a number of our meetings. We thought that that was complying because you were there at our monthly updates. Uh, but then I was informed that that wasn't. So I, I need to understand, I guess, are we considered to have complied or not? Because I don't want to waste time applying if because of that, uh, we would be considered to have not met the requirement. Yeah. No, that's a great question. And there was some confusion about that. But so let me try and clarify. Um, what we're talking about here in terms of reporting is any reporting that you are to submit through the Memorandum of Understanding to the City of Roanoke related to the ARPA funds. And um, I believe those were quarterly. Um, what created some confusion is that the Gun Violence Prevention Commission uh, members were, uh, as a way of expanding connection with the grant recipients. Uh, each commissioner became a liaison to a grant uh, receiving organization. That was simply a means to try and uh, get bring reports back to the commission. That was a separate reporting mechanism, not directly connected to the ARPA fund reporting. And that created some confusion. And for that, we apologize. Um, so I think to keep things more simplified, um, it will be uh, better to just make sure that the reporting is aligned with what's requested in the Memorandum of Understanding and to follow that report guideline. Is that accurate, Angie? Yeah, that's spot on. Okay, thank you. And thanks for that question, Hunter. So in the files to upload, you're gonna to wanna to include a specific timeline. Um, and because we anticipate that um, with the deadline for applications being the 31st and the review process that by that January, I think it was 22nd meeting, um, that meeting will be for those who have received funds uh, to clarify the process moving forward. So you could look at an end of January to end of June timeline. And if there's any variation in that timeline, we will uh, certainly inform you of that as early as possible. Uh, in addition to the timeline, be, have a clear budget for your program. And if you are including a curriculum in your program, it's important that you include that curriculum or at, at the least an uh, overview of that curriculum, especially if the program is education-based. And those can all be uploaded as files. All right, that's an overview of the application itself. And I'm going to ask um, Laura Carini at this point to go over the treasury guidelines and the reporting responsibilities. And uh, Laura, if you could cover the, what was on the base of that application, I think that would be helpful. Absolutely, yes. Um, so as we've been talking about, all of these funds are coming from the US federal ARPA funds that we received um, in 2021. Um, because of that, we do, the city has many requirements that the city is um, required to do, and therefore we're passing those requirements on to you. Um, so while they may seem burdensome and they may be a little bit 
out of the ordinary than what we may normally ask for. Um, we're we're just asking them because it's it's what's required by the the U.S. Treasury. Um, so because of that, um, the ARPA funds generally were only you know to be used for certain purposes. Um, the the ARPA law was amended. Um, I think in late 2021, early 2022, to allow funds to be used specifically for gun violence prevention. Um, so um, that's why we have to um, have the description of, of how the program that you're proposing is, is directly related to some type of prevention intervention um, program so that we can, that is a, a requirement under the guidelines um, to, to show that connection. Um, so that's the use of the funds. Um, hopefully that's not, um, you know, the, the difficult part. So then um, I think, as Joe said, we have a limited amount of funds for this um, for this effort. Um, so um, as you can see, there's, you know, many of you on here. So um, uh, you'll understand that not everybody may receive funds and, and everyone will receive maybe a, a portion of, of what they're asking for, um, just to be aware of that. Um, and um, I, I think I saw this earlier, but this is um, the final round of ARPA funds. Um, we will not be having any other grant um, application periods for ARPA funds. This this is it. We are coming to the end of the use of ARPA funds. So, um, so that this is our our last our last round for that. Um, so obligations. Um, and there, it's outlined there on the application. Um, of course, the first obligation is spend the money. Um, this is very important and we're making sure everyone understands that this money, if you are awarded it, we expect you to expend it all no later than June 30th of 2024 of you know next year. So you will have about five and a half months um, by the time you award are awarded the money um, if you're awarded to spend the money. And that is, um, we believe, a, a, a pretty big ask. So we ask that you really be thoughtful about that and you commit to being able to do that um, in a reasonable way when you are applying. Um, of course, maintain detailed records. Um, I, I know that all of you are very familiar with grant um, funding and, and you have to keep your records, keep your receipts. We do not need you to submit those documents with your reports. We just need you to have those. Um, some of you may have been audited when we were recently audited and you may have been asked for those receipts. So at any time, we of course may have an audit and we will need those receipts to be produced at that time. Um, but please um, hold on to them and those do not need to be submitted with any of your reports. Um, the next obligation, provide quarterly status updates. Um, we may, obviously this is a very short time period, so we may just ask for like one update, maybe halfway through, maybe that's like March or April, just to make sure you're on track. Again, because of the timeliness of this, we need to be making sure that everyone is on track to be spending the money because if there's any signs that you may not be able to spend the money by June, we may have to pivot and um, and help you um, figure that out. Hunter, did you have a question about, um, I don't know if your hand just went up or? Yeah, uh, it's about the distinction between spent and encumbered. Um, sure. So sometimes, uh, and I just want to make sure to clarify because in planning out our grant, uh, especially with ours typically related to agriculture, if we spend money, sometimes we've committed to putting money towards a project that we've started and the work may include some like follow-up upkeep. So for instance, planting a tree and someone's going to continue watering it and that's that will last the whole year. So I'm just trying to understand if there's a distinction here between spent versus encumbered, if the work kind of continues after we've spent it, does that mean it's technically not spent even if we've already contracted to have the work done and paid the contract? Okay, great question. And yes, so that definitely has been an issue um, as we've gone along. However, with this round, we are making it very clear. Spent, spent money by June 30th. So the money is out the door 
in somebody else's pocket out of your account <laughs> completely spent, um, not just encumbered. We want it um, completely spent. And, and then would, would that then include if we've spent it and paid for a contractor to do work, um, if the work continues past that date, is that permissible or is that not permissible? So if you like contract for someone, so for say a thousand dollars and, and you pay them a thousand dollars, but they're still continuing the work, I would say as long as, and this is getting very technical, um, but as long as there's no reason for that money to come back, I feel like it's spent. Um, I've been on webinars with the U S treasury and it's because if for some reason your contractor say they go out of business then technically, and they've done like half the work, then that half of that money would come back to you. We do not want that. So, so I would say that you need to be, the money needs to be spent and with no way of it to be coming back for a reason that if the work doesn't get done in the future. So yes, fully spent and, uh, and no way to be returned. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Laura, I think Darnell Wood has his, uh, his hand up too. Okay. Darnell. Are you able to speak? I didn't, I knew he didn't speak earlier, so I wasn't sure if he Can could. Can you hear put... me okay? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. Uh, no, the, uh, I guess with the last grant, uh, and like I said, there was some confusion, uh, but the, we did the quarterly and also the monthly reports. And I understand during this grant process, will there be someone, Laura, over each grant person or each grant that is delivered where we can report back to? Is that going to be done this way, just like it was last time? Stacy, um, sure. sure. That's a good, go ahead, Joe. Well, I, I, I'll, let me start answering this. Darnell, your organization was fantastic in terms of connecting with your liaison through the commission and giving monthly reports. Um, that is that is not required okay. for this cycle. If you choose to do that, that is informative uh, because one of the things we like to do at our monthly commission meetings is get updates um, on how the work is going. Uh, what kind of successes you're experiencing, what kind of challenges, but we also don't want that to be feel like an added workload for you. So the the only requirement is that you do the, as Laura said, the midway uh, report and then the final report. Um, so it, it, if you want to uh, submit a monthly report just as uh, your own measure of accountability to share with the commission, you can certainly do that. And you can actually just send that directly to Angie and she can make sure the commission receives that information. Okay, thank you. And we will make and it very clear since we understand that there was some confusion then, um, both in the award meeting in January and also in the MOU of mm -hmm you know, a status report, whatever it is, halfway through on this date to this person, that's your obligation. And then the final report um, in June. So uh, we can make that very clear. And and um, one, one last question. I noticed in the application, of course, it has the four zones, Southeast, Southwest, Northeast, and Northwest. As far as are, are these grant funds, uh, Joe, and you probably can answer this, are these mainly are geared to Northwest or, uh, of course, we geared out to Northwest last year, but we did cover some parts of Northeast with uh, one of our conference, two of our conferences as well. But do you, uh, these grant we, funds? We would like for you to prioritize Northwest because that's where the greatest intensity of the gun violence incidents is, is the highest density. Uh, it does not. It does not exclude the other areas because gun violence has impacted the whole city. Mm -hmm. But we would like for you, as to the degree that you're possible, focus your uh, efforts on Northwest. So you you may, for example, Darnell, if you were going to apply, you may say we're going to have three quarters of our events or outreach in Northwest, mm -hmm. and we also want to do some outreach in these other areas. So that that would be perfectly fine. All right. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you.
Uh, there was a question raised about, is there a maximum length for the narrative? Um, there is no maximum length or character count. Uh, you can um, be as verbose as you want to be. Um, uh, I would encourage you not to overdo it. Uh, just be as clear as you can um, with the narrative. And then uh, Chris, you asked, uh, you will not have a liaison this time. If you have questions about the grant, I would encourage you to reach out directly to Angie O'Brien or Laura Carini. They are the city staff people who are in charge of overseeing this. Um, we will not be appointing liaisons from the commission. Uh, as I shared with Darnell, if you want to share an update of how your work is going with the commission, you can send that to Angie uh, and she will make sure the commission gets that information. Uh, Ann Rogers, did I see your hand up? Yes, I um, do you foresee um, if an application comes in requesting funding for services Ex, uh, exclusively outside Northwest Roanoke, do you do you see any opportunity there, or or not? Um, I, there is certainly opportunity. I think what we will likely do is try and it, it give priority to Northwest, but that does not mean we're going to exclude other areas. So I I would not, uh, though I know your service area is primarily in Southeast Roanoke. Um, I would encourage you to apply. And um, uh, I don't see that as a discouragement. I just want to be clear that uh, to the extent possible, we're trying to direct as many services as we can into Northwest Roanoke because that has seen the highest density of gun violence in our city. But other parts of our city have also experienced gun violence. So um, while we're prioritizing that, that does not necessarily exclude an organization that may be working outside of Northwest. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Laura, was there anything else you wanted to add? I'll just quickly, um, the last few items. Um, so we talked about a status report that will be required. Um, of course, the final report will be the most important thing. Um, and, and that'll be need to be fairly detailed about, you know, what you set out to do and the outcomes that you achieved. And this is again, from the US Treasury, they are very focused on performance outcomes and um, performance measures. So um, I think in the last grant, you know, we asked you to set those performance indicators at the beginning and in your grant application. So um, as quantitative and qualitative objectives that you can have in your application, um, the better. Um, I do know the, the commission is, is definitely looking for those types of outcomes as well. Um, and there's the other requirements. I mean, it's, it's listed on the application. It will be listed on the MOU. We will talk about it at our the award meeting if you are awarded funds. Um, there will be, you know, there's other obligations in the MOU. Um, and I think in general, as for the ARPA guidelines, you know, we put it on all the recipients to be familiar with the ARPA guidelines and be sure that their programs are complying. Um, you know, we do expect you to to take that obligation. So that's all I've got. If you have any other questions, let me know. Thank you, Laura, for that great overview. Uh, and I do want to say to you all, uh, some of you are very experienced in writing grants, um, both on a local, state, and federal level. And some of you may be brand new at this. Uh, if you have questions at any time, whether in the preparation of your application or um, uh, during the, the process of, um, you know, offering your program, uh, in 2024, please know that uh, we are here to assist you in that and and draw on each other. I mean, we've got some very experienced grant writers on this webinar tonight and some who may be brand new. Part of this effort is to realize that we can collaborate with each other. We we don't exist in silos. We, we each do our unique work, but we're here because we care about this city and this community and this region. So please draw on others. Don't be afraid to ask questions for clarification. Um, everybody that I know on this call and my experience of the nonprofit world is people are more than happy to share advice and wisdom 
on on how to do the best possible thing you can do. So don't be afraid to ask. At this point, I'm going to um, ask uh, Angie um, to talk a little bit about how these ARPA funds became available and a, a gun lock program that will also be uh, launching in the new year that um, it is in part a response to nonprofit organizations want to wanting to do gun, gun lock distribution and education. So Angie, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Joe. And just a reminder, everybody, if I go on mute, I'll come back. So I know Joe and Laura both talked about the additional meeting that's going to be on January 22nd. This is a required meeting. So we're going to want to make sure that you're there or somebody from your organization is there so we can go over that agreement with you. As a quick reminder, many of you have received grants from us before that are ARPA related. So I'm not going to go into great detail about that. Um, but I do want to make sure that you understand that these um, these funds are federal and are from the feds and the, the state government and the uses have been identified by the Star City Safe Recovery and Resiliency Advisory Panel approved by the Roanoke City Council. Well, Angie's taking a little breather. Um, she's going to forward the information to Laura to finish out the report. Um, Hunter and Darnell, I still see your hands raised on the screen. Do you used to have additional questions or are you just like holding your hands up? I like holding them up, but I don't have any questions. <laughs> Thanks, Darnell. <laughs> Hunter, do you have another question? Mine, so. Okay, thanks. All right. So, Just, uh, so I'm not sure. Okay, we're going to give Angie just a minute to forward no, her. Maybe that helps. Sorry. That's all right. Thanks. Just want to make sure. Joe, while uh, Laura is waiting on Angie, I do want to say that uh, Laura and Angie were a great help to me during that 18 month. If, they, if I had any questions, they answered them, uh, gave me some directions and things of that nature. So they were a great help uh, during the last great pro grant process. And I want to just thank them for that. Thank you, Darnell. I know that means a lot. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I do, I've got Angie's notes. I will, um, I'll go over those. Um, so Angie was talking about, so we received the money from the federal and state government, um, the city council and panel, the star city safe recovery and resiliency advisory panel, and then made those recommendations, um, to the council city council and city council approved, um, how the this is the entire $65 million was to be spent. Um, this is a very unique approach to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, it's been recognized by the National League of Cis Cities and the Treasury Department. Um, we've had meetings in Washington, D.C. Um, talking about how um, we approached um, spending the ARPA funds. Um, both the city manager and mayor have been recognized for these efforts. Um, we broke the funds into three categories, response, recovery, and resiliency. Of course, response was a couple of years ago. Um, we are now in still somewhat recovery and of course, focused on resiliency, um, making our community resilient. 
Um, the gun violence funds specifically are part of the resiliency efforts to make transformational changes in our community. Um, so there is another um, exciting opportunity coming up that we wanted to, while we have all of you here, um, uh, this group of nonprofits, um, we felt it's a great opportunity to highlight this upcoming initiative. Um, we have not rolled out this effort yet. We are just finishing up the planning stages of this project in hopes to publicize in mid-January. Um, there are a few things that could slow us down, however, so please understand this is our goal and a number of things can happen to cause delays. We are going to be announcing a gun lock program. This is going to be a joint effort between the Roanoke City Police Department, the Gun Violence Prevention Commission, City Administration, the Reset Team, and the Youth and Gang Violence Prevention Team. This is an educational training and awareness effort. The city will be purchasing 10,000 gun locks. Gun locks will then be made available at libraries, rec centers, um, Angie's office and the city manager's office. However, we are going to be making these gun locks available to nonprofits for your events and for your programs, perhaps even some of the programs that you will be applying related to this grant. We are continuing to work out the final details. However, it is going to be, we're going to make it a very simple process to obtain the gun locks. There will also be an educational component, support from the Roanoke Police Department, and a video series that we're working on with RBTV um, with different targeted um, audience. However, oh, sorry. We do have a name for this program that Angie has worked very hard on. However, we can't verify that it isn't being used elsewhere. So we're gonna keep that to ourselves for now. And I promise it is good. The objectives behind this opportunity are, one, prevention of accidental shootings. Gunlocks Act is a simple and effective measure to prevent accidental shootings, especially involving children who may come across unsecured firearms at home. Two, reducing unauthorized access. Implementing gun locks helps restrict access to firearms, reducing the likelihood of unauthorized individuals, including children or individuals in a crisis, using them in harmful ways. Three, suicide prevention. I'm gonna kind of not go into all the detail, sorry. Um, four, community education. Um, five, supporting mental health initiatives. Six, law enforcement collaboration. Seven, mitigating homicide risks. And eight, empowering responsible firearm owners. Um, so Angie um, wanted to announce this tonight. Um, as um, we said, that this will be um, kind of, I don't know if it'll be exclusively available for nonprofits. I'm sure we'll work with the schools and other organizations, but we will be making... Um, we are doing the 10,000 gun locks, but we will distribute small amounts of those um, to nonprofits on a, a request basis, um, which we will give out those details at a later date um, so that we can spread these around the community um, along with the educational um, series. So I think that was the, the gist of that, but more details will be coming. Um, but we want everyone to be aware of that, that that's coming and to, to be prepared um, and as maybe include that in any of your proposals if, if, if it's relevant. Okay. Thank you, Laura, and thank you for preparing that, Angie. Um, all right. We, um, I think we've gone over everything we wanted to share with you tonight. Uh, we'll open it up for any additional questions that you may have. And we will also send out a link to the recording after the meeting so that if you uh, need to review it for any reason, for any details about uh, any of the topics we covered, you'll have access to that. And as I said before, if you have any questions about the application process, please reach out to Angie and Laura, and they will be glad to assist you. Uh, application deadline is 1159.59 on December 31st, and um, then over a three-week period, those will be reviewed and um, uh, 
distributions made, announcements shared, and then the follow-up meeting is on January 22nd, 2024 at 2 o'clock p.m. All right. I don't see any other questions. So thank you all so much for attending tonight. Thank you for your investment in our city and everything all you do uh, to make this uh, place called Roanoke an extraordinary place. Um, happy holidays uh, to everyone. Um, and may you be well as we go into this new year. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank Good night. Good night. Thank you.